What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and this is Block Digest episode 200 at block height 606,204 on December 1st. 200 fucking episodes. So, uh, instigator of this all beginning, how are you doing today? That's all of us, right? Yeah, who are you asking? <laughs> I, 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 was, I was, yeah, everybody, I don't know. Yay, 200 fucking episodes. Who the hell would have thought we'd be here? It's great to be here. We'd have gotten there even faster if we had kept the original schedule of Block Digest when we started, which I think was every single day. <laughs> yeah, no, um, nope. Uh, I don't think I could have done that. I would have snapped and become a crazy person. Mm-mm, mm-mm. The shows are also a lot shorter, though. I still think I well, would have could- snapped. Can't have too much of a good thing. Mm-hmm. So, so guess, yeah, who, what's, else, what's... who else is with us? Who's with us today? Meow. All right. No, they're not there. Damn it. Oh. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's me, Chris, Janine today. It sucks that uh, Nopara and Rick aren't here, but it's fucking awesome to have you here for this again, Chris. You're, you're going to be pulled back into this one way or another, you son of a bitch. Pull me. Pull me. <laughs> So yeah, I guess, you know, all fun things and landmark episode numbers aside, I uh, think today's going to start off with a really heady topic that I think there's going to be a decent amount of disagreements over. So uh, I don't know, Janine, you want to give us the breakdown so we can start arguing after that? <laughs> Yeah, so the number one thing that everyone's been talking about over the past two days is the announcement that Virgil Griffith, uh, who if anyone doesn't know, we've briefly talked about him a few times on Block Digest, um, various things that he's done or alleged to have done and said. And um, if anyone doesn't know, he is or was, I'm not sure about the current status, to be honest, but he was the head of uh, special projects at the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, so I, th- I believe that would be a relatively high, you know, management position within the organization. And um, uh, I don't I don't have the episodes noted when we last talked about him, but it was pretty recent. It was like over the summer or fall where I mentioned that he had made a statement to Coindesk about um, basically wanting to seek funding from Saudi Arabia and that would be or Saudi Arabian government specifically and that, that would be awesome if they invested a trillion dollars. Well, it turns out that he's gone to a few other rather dangerous countries uh, in the last year because uh, basically a few days ago, I think it was probably, it was either the 20th or the 27th. um, I believe it was announced on the 29th. um, But basically it was announced by the U S justice department that he was arrested at Los Angeles airport. Uh, And the reason is that he's been charged with, um, well, it's a it's a count of conspiracy, but uh, the conspiracy is that he allegedly uh, intended to um, he, he well he not only broke a travel ban that is supposedly in place uh, under the Trump administration for Americans going to North Korea, but he uh, because he gave a technical presentation the. U.S. government believes that that constitutes providing technical knowledge or tools or whatever advice to a foreign power that is on a sanctions list. So that's uh, strike number two. And 
Uh, I don't think there's obviously. I don't think it's illegal to seek to revoke your U.S. citizenship or seek citizenship elsewhere. But that's also mentioned in the indictment, and even if that's not a criminal offense, uh, the U.S. doesn't like losing its own citizens. Um, but yeah, uh, I can go into more specifics about it. Um, just a second, I'll you guys can chat about it briefly, and I'll switch to the indictment page. Mm-hmm. I mean, like. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to be taking probably a pretty nuanced, complicated stance on this topic. So, like, you know, first, I just want to say from a moral or an ethical perspective, what he did is completely indefensible, like point blank. But I am very worried about how this goes forward procedurally and exactly what actions of his are used to press charges and if he's convicted actually secure that conviction because despite all the specifics of this the basis on which that happens could set very chilling precedents for just writing or distributing code or explaining things technically in this space and i think that's something like people need to really consider and not just dismiss out of hand is, oh, he was helping a nutcake dictator. Yeah, so... Go ahead. The talk that he he gave in uh, North Korea was actually called Blockchain and Peace, believe it or not. Huh, I didn't know that actually. All I've seen are the the meme slides going around, like how to avoid sanctions. Yeah, I can't... I can't remember where, I think it's actually mentioned in the indictment. I read the whole thing, and I think they actually mentioned that the title was Blockchain and Peace, or Blockchains and Peace. Um, I'll check that right now. It is, I'll just check. Yeah, so specifically, he's been charged with <clears throat> a conspiracy to violate the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Um, and if According to this, it, he, well, the other, so there's a number of interesting elements besides what he is alleged to have done, some of which he supposedly admitted to the FBI directly on at least two occasions. Um, so basically, there's a FBI agent, um, Brandon Kavanaugh, and the so the indictment is written from his perspective, and he says that... <clears throat> Basically, uh, within the last year, I think it was April of this year, there was a cryptocurrency blockchain and cryptocurrency conference in um, in North Korea, and it, there's an organization. I think it's like uh, Friends of Korea or something. Uh, let me look. There should be a document. But uh, basically, there's a there's a particular travel agency. There's a lot of there, there's a number of travel agencies that help people visit North Korea if they're interested in doing that but a lot of them are they have certain restrictions on like who like what nationalities um they're willing to accept and a lot of them will not accept Americans because they they consider like a lot of the travel agencies will have businesses elsewhere besides doing traveling to North Korea and they don't want to risk uh you know angering the United States by obviously trying to go around a travel ban while that's in place. Uh, but apparently the one that Virgil used, which, uh, I mean, as far as we know, he definitely did go. That's not in question because one of the interesting aspects of this case is that he was not discreet at all about the fact that he went. He was posting pictures of his visa on Twitter. He was tweeting about the fact that there's going to be another event next year. Um, so it's not at all in question at this point that he went. Um, the question is what were the circumstances of his contact with the U.S. government asking for permission? Did they deny permission because they're claiming that they denied permission? Um, and the other part is what exactly he told them during these two supposedly consensual interviews that this FBI agent claims that he had. Which, you know, I've said this before when, I, when we've talked about indictments, never take a government indictment at face value because all, like, none of this has been challenged at all yet. He's been arrested, he's, he's sitting in a jail somewhere, and he hasn't released any kind of defense, so never take any of this at face value. 
But considering the fact that he has made social media posts about going to Korea and even some tweets that I would say are uh, kind of awkwardly uh, praising North Korea or looking at it in a very positive light, um, that definitely raises a lot of red flags. And so the fact that he was so nondiscreet about publishing the fact that he was going to North Korea and even his visa, despite the fact that that would obviously bring some negative attention, it wouldn't surprise me if he was naive enough to not only, like, he not only apparently went back to the United States since he's gone to North Korea, but he brought devices with him where... Uh, those devices contained records of conversations that he'd had about traveling to North Korea and why he wanted to go there. And supposedly another part of this charge um, that violates the uh, International Emergency Economic Powers Act specifically is that he attempted, I don't know if he was successful, I don't think the indictment actually says whether he was successful, but he at least was trying to attempt to make a cryptocurrency transfer, which they don't say Ether specifically, but it's pretty obvious from the indictment that they're probably talking about Ether. Not completely certain, but it probably is, considering he's at the Ethereum Foundation. Um, so he basically tried to make a transfer of cryptocurrency between North and South Korea, and again, that's, that's a big no-no. And so all of these records of conversations were apparently on the device that they seized. Now, of course, we know that there's been incidents in the past of people's devices being seized and then the the record of conversations is manipulated in the government's favor because they have the tools to do that. So who knows? But um, it just sounds like based on the indictment that he was extremely naive and went back to United, the United States with his devices that could potentially be of interest and compromised um, or accessed by the government. And if it's true that he participated in a consensual interview twice with the FBI, I don't know when they say consensual interview, I assume that means he knows he's talking to an FBI person or at least a government person. Um, I'm assuming that's not an undercover, like you think that this person is your friend or someone you just met. Um, I assume that consensual means that he knew it was an FBI or government person. But yeah, it just seems like this whole case is full of naivete because like, I, I don't know, I don't, it, it would be, I would be very surprised if he thought that he could just go to North Korea and not attract any attention and there would be no issues, especially if he specifically asked for permission to go and then was denied it. Like, I don't see, like he, I would be surprised if he didn't anticipate something like this happening. Um, because he, you know, this is this industry is getting a lot of uh, regulatory attention. The idea that someone who's working at the Ethereum Foundation, which is already in kind of a contentious role within Ethereum, the idea that that kind of person would not be of interest, especially if they're talking about going to North Korea and and one of the other things people keep saying is, oh, he could have gone there to you know, teach North Korean dissidents. It's like, guys, the the kinds of people who, first of all, the kinds of people who get allowed into North Korea, they get vetted. They get vetted by the government there. If you're going to a conference there, that is all getting vetted. Um, what you're able to talk about is extremely restricted. And the people who allow to, who are allowed to attend these kinds of conferences is extremely restricted. Like you're basically just talking to the upper class of North Korea who has, you know, some degree of freedom and power compared to 99% of the population. You're not going to be finding dissidents at these conferences, or at least you're not going to be found out and out, maybe some in the government that want to do that. But this is not, this is not a circumstance where you would be in a position to help anyone there because <clears throat> it's just not that kind of place. Like it's, it's there, there's people like starving because of how strictly controlled everything is. And it's just not going to happen. So there's no way that if he had those intentions, again, it's naivete that there's no way that would have been possible. And the, there's another claim that because supposedly he 
one of the topics he discussed specifically, don't know if he actually used these exact words or maybe it was implied, we'll have to find that out too, but the government alleges that he was discussing how to evade sanctions um, and things like that. And that um, there, there's a specific paragraph, I think, actually, where they mentioned that he was specifically told by the organizers of the conference to talk about that. Um, which, I mean, again, if, if, if I was someone, I don't, I would never do this, but if I was someone who was going to a conference like this, I would know going in that I would be in in an extremely dangerous and restricted situation where these people can tell me what to say, tell me what not to say. And, you know, I have to go in knowing that they could tell me to say stuff that might anger other governments in the world, especially the U.S. government. So the, I like, it should not be surprising to him that they would not only be interested in this, but that they would ask about it and that he would be under pressure to talk about it. Um, because if they ask you to talk about something, you're going to talk about it or you're going to piss them off. So again, there's just, it seems like a very... He seems like a very naive person. Whether naivete justifies 20 years in prison, I don't think so. Um, But we, again, we have to see the circumstances of the case from both sides, and we haven't gotten that yet. This is just an indictment. But yeah, that's some of the details of the case. See, like, the one thing I'm worried about here is just precedent setting. You know, like, Peter Todd... Uh, in, in response to this, brought up the um, ISIS shooter in California a couple years ago who the FBI tried stonewalling Apple over to get them to unlock his phone, where we found out later that literally the phone was unlocked and didn't even have a pin set when they got it off yeah. of the shooter. And they accidentally locked it and made that whole public push about that like i'm worried you see this get taken in that direction and all of a sudden scary precedents get set like you know it's by the looks of it he probably did go there to help the north korean government do idiotic things he should not have been helping them do but that's irrelevant if the precedent that gets set is like oh um you just talked about something and the wrong person heard you or, you know, like did this Ethereum transaction, like what, what, what if like I just try to send Bitcoin to somebody and somebody swaps an address out and I wind up sending to somebody in Iran, even though that's not what I was intending to do. Like I, I'm very worried about this creating a precedent where all of a sudden things like that become very viable ways to go after people in this space legally. Yeah, there's... Should we go over Vitalik's response on Twitter or? Yeah, I think we um, should. Well, we can't Shani, mention- what were you going to say? I, yeah, I was just going to, yeah, the, I was just going to mention that the Ethereum Foundation actually did respond. I think they responded to Vice Media or something. And, uh, well, it's kind of related to actually Vitalik. Um, because they claim that they did not support... Uh, I'm actually going to go find it, so very quickly you can chat again. Right, so um, making yourself unpopular with the Empire um, is not a good idea. And I think it's safe to say that Virgil Griffith, if you do take a look into his history, may have had reasons in the past to have uh, caused some upset in, in the Empire of the day. But I wanted to just go quickly over Vitalik Buterin's uh, tweet storm over it. Uh, he posted this on the 1st of December, uh, so that would be the, the day of this recording today. And he's going to start with tweet zero, prefacing with two points. Vitalik says, Con- conflict of inter- interest disclosure, Virgil is my friend. This whole thing has nothing to do with the Ethereum Foundation, and the Foundation paid nothing and offered no assistance. This was Virgil's personal trip. And he quotes Vir- one of Virgil's tweets uh, saying just that on the 18th of January. Um, he goes on to say, Vitalik, uh, geopolitical open-mindedness is a virtue. It's admirable. 
Um, to go to a group of people that one has been trained since childhood to believe is a maximum evil enemy and hear out what they have to say. The world would be better if more people on all sides did that. He carries on. And in fact, this virtue of his has paid off in multiple other contexts, improving relations with Ethereum Classic, Hyperledger and others. Abridging slightly, I don't think that what Virgil did, this is Vitalik's words, I don't think that what Virgil did gave DRPK any kind of real help in doing anything bad. He delivered a presentation based on publicly available information about open source software. There was no weird hackery or advanced tutoring in quotes. And if there was any indication of that, it was going in that direction. I would have reacted much more strongly, Vitalik says. Virgil made no personal gain from it. And he then closes out by saying, I hope the USA shows strength rather than weakness and focuses on genuine and harmful corruption that it and all countries struggle with rather than going after programmers delivering speeches, parroting public information. So I think there are two real elements here. One is Virgil's personal judgment. We haven't actually heard his side of the story. We don't even know if he's still detained because this is now Sunday, the 1st of December. Uh, you know, he was supposed to be in, in the hearing, I think by Friday at the latest. Um, so we don't know if he's been bailed. I have tried to get that information and I haven't received anything. Um, so we don't know. We haven't heard his side of the story. The other aside from his judgment, is just looking at the facts of the case. The, the fact is that he did, as a US citizen, the, the indictment makes clear that any US person inside of US's borders or outside is covered under the OFAC uh, rules. And, and it may not um, help or, or provide any assistance to any countries that are named on the sanctions list. And so by doing that, uh, you know, and you know that then then he you know he he has he has uh, breached those sanctions regardless of whether or not he made some errors in judgment we none of us here on this show are lawyers full disclosure that you don't need reminding of that so i think that the the community is kind of mostly coming down on the side of 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 his bad judgment but at the end of the day he he did make a choice um, he did choose to go to this country. He did choose to say some of these things. There were also personal text messages and things. Um, it actually reminds me a lot of the Charlie Shrem case, where I believe that the state had against him uh, an email uh, in which he had had an exchange where someone told him what they wanted to do with some of the funds that they were using to transfer his platform. That that some from memory, it was something involving drugs on on Silk Road. And uh, Shrem, if I recall correctly, replied, cool. It was a very short email. And the state used that against Shrem to say, look, you, you seem to know what was going on here and you allowed it to happen anyway. And when you, when you, you are at this sort of fringe element of technology and you are invading a domain, which is what a hacker you know, fundamentally does. You're invading someone else's property. You're doing, you're, you're, you are somewhere where you ought not to be. Um, one does need to move with care, regardless of how you handle it after you've done it. He, he needed to have handled himself with care. So, um, yeah, that's uh, Vitalik's response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, quickly, I'll just add the, um, the Ethereum Foundation responded yesterday and they said, we can confirm that the foundation was not represented in any capacity at the events outlined in the Justice Department's filing and that the foundation neither approved nor supported any such travel, which was a personal matter. We are continuing to monitor monitor the situation as it develops. Now, I don't know, like, I, I don't remember exactly what Vitalik's position is explicitly. Ethereum Foundation, isn't he, is he president or something? I can't remember what his role He's is. He's resident but... boy genius. Okay, but like, what's it? I I don't remember what his official title or capacity is within the Ethereum Foundation. Does anyone know that? But the point I want to make is that he's involved with Ethereum at a very high level, and so just because the Ethereum Foundation 
you know, didn't give, there's no paper record of them giving approval and they weren't involved in this. Um, there is record on social media when Virgil was talking about going, he was told, Vitalik responded at one point, enjoy, quote. Um, so they were aware of it. And I'm, I'm just surprised that I mean, they have to have a ton of law. Uh, well, I don't know how competent their legal, uh, their legal advisors are, but I I would be really surprised if they. I, it seems to me that they were at least aware of it, or at least Vitalik was. So I'm surprised that they kind of like it. To me, it would seem like they wouldn't want that kind of PR risk whatever they estimated it to be, I feel like they would have, if they were smart, they would have cut him off because now their organization is going to be cited in all of the news media reports that one of their people has, you know, allegedly been involved in helping North Korea evade sanctions. Like, it just doesn't, it didn't seem like a smart move for them to just say, you know, that we're not giving approval and we're not involved in the trip, we're hands off, but this guy is still working with us and Vitalik made the decision to, you know, respond positively to that, at least one of those announcements that he was going. So that's just, this whole thing just does not seem smart um, at all to me. See, like, I, I think Vitalik is doubling down on stupid with this response thread in that he's not just trying to point out the risk of precedent setting. He's, like, trying to morally or ethically defend what Virgil did. And, I mean, just from that point of view, like, no. Um, even going into this situation with the assessment of just guard my mouth is highly unethical in my opinion like to involve yourself in any way with an organization like the north korean government is reprehensible and like what vitalik's doing here is it's like it's it's completely conflating and blurring those two separate sides of the issue like the the morality or ethics of it and the potential danger of the precedent it's set when I think it's, it is incredibly important right now, early on, to completely disentangle those things and, and concentrate on the, the potential precedent this could set, rather than trying to morally defend him because that, that's indefensible in my mind. Yeah, I agree with you. His, his tweet was very normative. It was all about what you should do. And it, it was basically making an ethical claim, which I did find rather bizarre, though I do understand that that in the past Vitalik has, um, you know, like I've described him, he is a professional PR person. He is a mastermind at it. And I think he always wants to make himself appear that he's, he's not reading from a script that he is real, that he is authentic. Um, and he doesn't want to do the predictable thing which he mentions in his tweet storm. Um, so I think that, you know, people have reminded him, including a law professor here, um, who's saying that he should learn more about the IEPA and read the allegations in the complaint more carefully and take a short intro class into the American legal system. Um, and I think that that's correct. Um, it's not really about the way we're focusing right now on the on the reaction to what he's done, but I will draw um, our audience's attention uh, please go see uh, Vir Virgil's uh, Wikipedia page. He has a Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia page that does mention under the heading computer career that on the 14th of August 2007 that he released a software utility called Wikiscanner that tracks Wikipedia article edit edits from unregistered accounts back to their originating IP address and identified the corporations and organizations to which they belonged. It goes on to say that in 2008, together with Aaron Schwartz, yeah, that's that Aaron Schwartz, uh, Griffiths designed the Tor2 web proxy. Um, clearly, he was of interest to the empire already. Um, there would have been, you know, perhaps a small bounty internally among federal agents that if, if they could find something to stick this guy with, uh, just, just take it, whatever you can find. And I don't care if it's a parking ticket, a speeding ticket. Um, and he does look like the kind of guy that likes to do crazy things. You know, he's the kind of guy that 
perhaps I speculate that when he is making a mistake, he is fully aware of the mistake that he is making and yet goes ahead and does it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also want to, since you read it, I want to address Vitalik's point that, you know, we should all strive to, you know, talk to people who may have grown up being indoctrinated that, you know, they're, they're the enemy of the world, blah, 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 and authoritarianism, etc. Um, look, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting tired of the kind of people like him who think that talking to people about blockchain is some magic pill that turns them into, like, good people or good little geeks or something that it's like a magic pill to like not make them believe in these kinds of systems anymore or that they'll you know finally be inspired to break out um first of all no and second there is nothing that i've seen about virgil in the last couple of years that i've known about him as a person i haven't seen anything to suggest that he has skills in like de-propagandizing people who live in authoritarian countries like knowing a lot about blockchains and the power they give you and money and stuff like a new way of doing money like that's that's not (laughs) that's not a recipe to like have enough of an impact at a conference like this that it would be worth the risk of doing that like the 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 chances that you would actually have that effect on someone strongly enough is is not it's not believable so i can't i'm not going to agree with vitalik's statement that we should applaud him for like being open-minded or something because actually it seems it seems very close-minded to me to have the perspective that you're a tech person and therefore you understand this culture enough to be able to you know break them out of their shell or whatever that just seems really arrogant that doesn't seem open-minded to me um so yeah that i yeah there's there's a lot of things there but in terms of the in terms of the precedent it depends on which aspects cuz from the indictment it it's not actually clear what aspects of the conspiracy the government cares about in terms of like what they think are important details regarding the crime that they think he committed um, and things that they just mention as ancillary information that they think makes their case look strong. Um, so there's a free speech aspect to it, like can they criminalize the fact that he actually gave a speech about technology at all? Um, could, like, what's the line between the speech and what could be constituted as advice or help or whatever? Like we don't we don't know other than the title. We don't actually know. I don't I haven't been able to find anything about the content of the presentation other than these quotes about what he supposedly said about evading sanctions or whatever. So, we would probably have to see the content to determine whether at any point something he said could even be construed as advice or maybe there was something in private later, you know, that th- there needs to be a lot more detail, but yeah, I I definitely find it concerning if they go the route of, you know, yes, he he wasn't supposed to be there because we denied permission. Um, he wasn't supposed to. I mean, if he didn't make any financial gain, then I guess that that that's another thing that he could have violated if he had made economic gain or did, you know, any kind of economic activity there. That could also be an issue. But if he didn't, then maybe that's not a big concern. But if they're going to focus on the part where he he gave technical expertise that couldn't have been accessed elsewhere and that was influential enough to, you know, enable them to evade sanctions using this technology, that would that would be a yeah, that would be a bad precedent because um I don't know how strongly they would apply that to other people who are giving talks in not sanctioned countries, but that would definitely not be a good road to go down where people who give talks, um, who may be speaking to broad audiences that they don't know 
at the actual location. And if the talk is recorded, it's obviously being distributed around the world and who knows who's watching that. Like, um, that would be, that would not be a good precedent to set at all. Yeah. I mean, it, what, what, what if I go give a talk somewhere in Europe on just privacy and fungibility in general, just because the, the, those are important aspects or qualities in a money and some guy from Iran is in the audience and I talk to him after that and I have no clue where he's from or who he is. And then I find out he's an employee of the Iranian government and bam, I'm in the exact same situation that Virgil is right now. No, because Virgil knew the audience and he was explicitly told he should not go. In fact, the indictment says that Virgil knew it was illegal to travel. What you're talking about there is a speech to a general group of people and one of them happens to be, without your knowledge, a member of a sanctioned country. That's different. Yeah, but how easy is it to argue that I did know and leave me with no way to prove a negative? Yeah, well, so, in, in, so... Wait, wait, wait. In, in law, in law. When you don't have the law, you pound the facts. And when you don't have the facts, you pound the law. Clearly, the state here has the facts, right? It's got an indictment full of facts. And so naturally, what's going to happen now is that people are going to try pounding the law. And what, what I think Vitalik and his friend who started a petition uh, to, to get Griffiths out of jail, Enrico Tallon, his name is, and the medium, he's posted an article here, is that they're sort of talking about how good of a person Virgil is. And they're talking about you know, other aspects of, of jurisprudence and, and broader senses. And this is what you do when the facts work against you. He didn't make a, a statement to a generic audience of whom one of them happened to be without his knowledge. That He actually went there after being denied permission and knowing it was illegal. Yeah, and but it was... So in this specific... I don't, like... I In this specific case, they also say that he answered question there was like a q a session and he answered questions from people who identified as government officials in in the country so he i don't know if he knew what the distribution or the who the general audience was like who everyone else was but he did know that at one point he was speaking to government or at least it was obvious that he was speaking to government officials at one point because they supposedly asked questions during the q a and they identified themselves as such um so in this case he would know who his audience was and you could also argue that because like there's so many documentaries uh, out there about other people traveling to North Korea and the types of people that they are allowed to interact with and not interact with. So a reasonable person who is going to this country would, they would, there would be information out there that they could figure out like the type of person they would be interacting with. Um, and then, like I said, it would mostly be like upper class government people who would be going to this conference because they're the only kinds of people that are allowed to go to these events. Um, yeah, but it's, it's about the the precedent like what what if they what if they're lying and they didn't give him a firm no or or if that just never makes it into the actual charges he gets hit with and it's all just about giving this talk knowing person x is listening now that sets that precedent and like how how do i prove now if that accusation is thrown at me that i didn't know that this this person worked for whatever government yeah, like like I said, I in terms of like the free speech impact, I I don't like this at all. It it really depends on what the government chooses to focus on. Obviously, the first indictment in any case is like it tries to be relatively general and as broad as possible and not giving it only gives the details that are absolutely necessary for making an arrest. That's the whole purpose of the indictment is is enough detail to justify an arrest and charges. So yeah, we're going to have to find out a lot more about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I also, I think if you read the indictment carefully, it does actually mention the specific law and the date at which the president uh, signed it into law. And remember that, that what Virgil is doing here is he, he's flying in the face of US foreign policy. When the president-elect actually, you know, puts a law, as far as I'm aware, um, 
that that is the official U.S. Uh, foreign policy. And for a U.S. citizen to then go overseas and undermine uh, that policy, I think, is what is particularly uh you know, at issue here. And it, the indictment also does mention that he was facilitating, he was pointing out uh, key people in the audience who could help uh, with with North Korea, right? So he, he wasn't just giving them information that was publicly available. He was facilitating, there were text messages. He was involved in some kind of cryptocurrency transfer. He acknowledged in that sequence of text messages that he believed it would be, you know, illegal and would be evading the sanctions. So again, with the facts and the law. The state does have the facts on their side. And I want to just make sure that I'm not being misunderstood here. I wish Virgil, you know, I really hope that he is released. Um, I do support him. I believe him. I believe uh, his friends when they say that he is a good person, he wants to resolve dispute. I want to believe that he was just naive in this case. Um, but the facts do speak for themselves today as I read this. Um, I think the last aspect uh, we haven't really talked about is the fact that they bring up this the the transfer of I mean it's it's pretty obviously Ethereum because at one person they say uh, they labeled it as cryptocurrency one and they say that he works at an organization that focuses on cryptocurrency one so that's very obviously Ether. Um, the thing that they don't go into detail is whether they believe the transfer of Ether like because it, it they don't give detail they just give they basically just have a message that implies that he did do this transfer. He was asking someone about it and stated that he knew that that was violating sanctions. But it's not clear whether he did that as a proof of concept on his own time for personal reasons just to say, hey, I did this, or if that transfer was somehow... Like, if that was supposed to be a demonstration of some sort for these North Korean officials that he was supposedly interacting with. Like they don't, they don't make a distinction there. They just say that this transfer happened and, you know, regardless that that would be in violation of the sanctions, but it would obviously be a lot more severe if he conducted that transfer as some kind of demonstration, you know, interacting with North Korean officials. Like that would, that would be a big difference in terms of, how that would be um prosecuted but yeah mm -hmm. i don't know i think uh at least i've beaten this uh to death with what i've got to say uh Jeannie and chris you guys have anything else to say nope oh um, well, i don't know if it'd be worth reading but there was um there was a post made by preston Byrne about this that i thought was kind of funny Okay, Preston wrote something. Yes, everybody should go read that. How many times did he talk about marmots? Alrighty. So, are we ready to hear about another idiot taking the Empire head-on, foolishly thinking that he stands a chance? Boom. Yep. So, um, a Mr. William Zitsky from Washington State in the U.S. Um, filed... In 2016, a capital gain of $104,000 on Bitcoin. And the next year realized that he had gotten the year wrong uh, in which those transactions occurred. Um, and actually for that year, 2016, only owed $410 of capital gains and um, amended his filing and requested a refund. And of course, um, the IRS is going to audit the fucking shit out of you in that because you just went, um, I fucked up. Give me a hundred thousand dollars back, please. Um, and so the IRS going through his uh, cryptocurrency transactions as well subpoenaed Bitstamp. Um, for his entire transactional history. And here is where uh, Mr. William Zitsky fucked up. Um, he tried arguing that the IRS is issuing this summons in bad faith, um, that it is not following the administrative steps in this situation required by law, and that 
the summons violated his Fourth Amendment rights to reasonable expectation of privacy, and the government cannot promise that it, it will actually secure data it gets from Bitstamp. So tried arguing, like, throw the entire uh, summons or subpoena for Bitstamp out. And pretty much what happened is the judge um, agreed that the scope was very wide and limited it to just um, transactions that occurred in 2016 to verify the claims with his amended filing. But he pretty much um, pointed to a 1976 um, U.S. Supreme Court ruling um, that a person lacks a reasonable expectation of privacy in a bank's records. Um, and there was another case in 2017 that kind of offered a different precedent or ruling, but was mostly concerned with privacy and surveillance rather than a lawfully made um, you know, summons or subpoena for information in a, in a lawful procedure. So like he, he, he should have never tried to push for anything more than limiting the records they get in the first place. And as far as the concern, the IRS cannot adequately secure the information. Um, the judge verbatim say this or said, this is to put it bluntly, not a legal argument. And so really the, the kind of the, the thing I want to say at the end here is well, when, when it comes to the, the empire's bureaucracy, as Mr. Chris likes to always put it, uh, wants to mess with you you be very tactical and thought out in what you actually try to do in response because this could have been very simple limiting the scopes of the data collected move on and set a nice precedent um as opposed to now um he, he wound up with the best outcome he could have hoped for but this is not going to be looked at kindly by this judge or other judges um, especially if other people find themselves in similar situations going forward, because rather than simply making a, a reasonable from their perspective request to limit the information to what they need, um, he tried making what a judge is going to see as a crazy, absurd argument. You can't trust the government. This is violating my constitutional rights. Re, um, and that, that doesn't play so well when, when you try to actually respond in court yeah i mean the last thing the irs wants to do is give away money um that they're they're definitely not going to respond to that kind of like or any part of the government's not going to respond well to that kind of request because that shit rarely happens people pay your taxes mm -hmm. like it, he would like this guy was straight up living in fantasy land thinking that he could go to the irs with that amended filing and not have to divulge a lot of private information to verify it like he was in fantasy land sounds like he had an accountant do it yeah but i mean it's like you know what i mean if you, you go to the government and go i fucked up um you owe me a hundred thousand dollars back um you're gonna have to cough up proof of that they're, they're not just gonna take you at your word here you go here's the check buddy but it's also to do with the dates as well. So presumably he still would have to give them some money back because all he did was move it uh, out of one tax year into the other. Um, so I don't know what his net gain would be. I don't know if the figure that's been quoted in the story is his net gain. I think based on like the, the framing of it, it, it seems like that's just the amount he owes gains on. Um and not the actual payment amount maybe but like I, either way like you're talking a hundred thousand dollars versus four hundred dollars regardless of that's what you're paying in taxes or owe a percentage of taxes on and to to come back to the irs like wait give me my money back like you're gonna have to let them probe you up the fucking rectum and verify everything if you expect to get money out of them yeah but yeah, this this guy is a goof, and uh, yeah, don't don't be a goof if the IRS starts knocking on your door. Uh, think things through. Alrighty, so next up, uh, 
There was a keynote address um, at the annual BPI 2019 conference uh, by Deputy Secretary, um, I think Justin um, Musinich, um, not Secretary Munchen, but um, it, it was kind of a three point, uh, I guess you could say roadmap roughly of, of the Treasury looking at long term economic issues and, and how they want to handle them. And one of those issues was specifically cryptocurrencies. Now, he, he kind of broke the, the keynote up into three points, and I'm going to buzz through the, the first two rather quickly. But in the first point, he mostly just went through um, tax reforms and um, you know the, the tax cuts that were pushed through under the Trump administration under the auspices of just trying to stimulate economic growth and lower the unemployment rate. And he's saying that's been a great success. And the the second point he brought up is the Department of the Treasury's role in national security. And ironically, uh, given the the first story of the day, the first thing is obviously sanctions. And the OFAC office that actually goes through analyzing that and reaching out to all the, the different private financial institutions to actually implement um, you know, sanctions and stop money from moving where we don't want it. And the second is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which is pretty much the, the regulatory body that decides whether or not a, a foreign investment is allowed to be made in American companies uh, based on whether or not it's a national security risk. And he kind of pats himself on the back at how much faster they're, uh, you know, letting through applications when there is no potential risk. Um, but the, the third point um, he brings up, kind of talking about digital currencies and the, the general kind of fintech um, revolution, is it kind of ties back into the second point, but it's mostly what I want to concentrate on in that. You know, I, I have never really seen any kind of systematic analysis of any of this from the Treasury. Like, there's all kinds of institutions in government, but I've never really seen the, the Treasury uh, step up and go, this is something to be worried about. And he kind of goes into delineating just general fintech and how. Um, you know, banks traditionally have a lot of different service, uh, payment processing, um, deposit holding, lines of credit, all bundled into a single thing. And even ignoring cryptocurrencies, where we're seeing this trend of those things unbundling. Like if you, if you look at how many people use things like Apple Pay or Cash App or Venmo or Google Pay or whatever, that that's completely decoupled from that checking function or that line of credit function and how this is a major shift going on in in the economy and how people attain financial services and even i think you know very presciently pointing out the likeliness that as these separate aspects of banking start growing and being adopted more they'll probably wind up rebundling all of these things that start as separate services into a single service again. And just kind of the, the rationale of how to regulate or deal with that, um, that likely progression that's coming without stifling innovation. And the, the kind of point he brings up regarding cryptocurrencies is what happens when this, this unbundling begins happening and something like Bitcoin can function as a, a payment rail for all of this. It, at, at big scale, it's, it's impossible to actually enforce their AML laws, to enforce things like sanctions. And it pretty much rounds it all off with you know the, the typical spiel of private currencies in the 1800s and how getting to the, the national dollar currency was a, was a good thing. And, and helped us create stability and the the prosperity that people want to see but like this is kind of you know showing even even the treasury now is starting to look at bitcoin and and things in the space and think how is this going to systematically undermine american authority 
And, you know, despite all the, the things like backed going on, the the congressional hearings where all everybody cheers on Twitter, oh, that one congressman seems to get it. What's important is these unelected bureaucrats. And I see a big kind of change in the way the wind's blowing there. And that's something that we need to really think about long term. All right. Well, Chris has nothing to say. Janine, what about you? I I also have nothing to say, but I will have something to say. All right. Then next up, uh, one more thing before I pass it to you. So some really interesting stuff is going on in the state of Georgia. Um. So I, I completely forget his name, but uh, one of the old uh, senile Georgian uh, senators uh, is retiring at the end of this year for health reasons. And the governor of Georgia um, has the authority to appoint an interim senator until the next election um, is purportedly planning to appoint Kelly Loeffler, the CEO of BAC to fill this Senate seat until 2020. Oh, God. And what's even more interesting is that she's getting dragged into what looks like a huge political fight between Trump and his supporters in the Republican Party and the governor and a discordant breakoff group. Um, Trump has a candidate that he wants appointed to this seat, uh, Doug Collins, I think is his name. Um, and the governor is at this point, I think a week ago, directly ignoring Trump's personal calls, attempting to get Collins appointed to this seat. And now these rumors are leaking that he's going to appoint, uh, Loeffler. So like we might honestly wind up with the CEO of a Bitcoin company sitting in Congress for a little bit. And that's happening uh, in complete defiance of President Trump's wish over who's appointed to fill this seat. And, and you know, to, to be a little more specific, he, he wants this Collins person appointed because Collins is very strongly against the impeachment going on right now. So if Loeffler actually fills this seat, this is going to cause major waves because every Republican trying to just stop the impeachment and deal with it um, is going to have their apparently desired strategy completely interrupted. Oh, great. That's just we need to bring Bitcoin into the mix of (laughs) the presidential impeachment. Impeachment. Oh, my God. I just remember because I when you first mentioned Georgia, I was like, were you talking about Georgia, the country? Or did you mean Georgia, the U.S. state? And then I realized U.S. state. But Georgia <laughs> is famous for peaches. Impeachment. That would be funny. If Georgia ends up being involved in that, that's going to be very memeable. This is the best timeline. All right, though. I guess. Um... Impeached by Georgia. <laughs> I guess so you want to take us into the uh, two updates on what's going on with Julian? Yeah, so the first, I split this up because it was kind of two, two things related to Assange, but not related in terms of the events. So first of all, there was a um, there was an event, uh, kind of a rally at Brandenburg Gate, uh, Brandenburger Tor in Berlin on November 27th. Uh, There was a bunch of people who gave speeches there, including Nils Melser from the UN, uh, John Shipton, uh, Assange's father, um, and then a few um, German politicians or party leaders, uh, participants and things like that. And the event was uh, started by the unveiling of the Anything to Say sculpture, which I think has been around since at least 2015 or 2016. Um, possibly earlier, but it's basically a statue uh, or a sculpture made of three statues of Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and Julian Assange, and they're all standing on chairs, and there's a fourth chair that it's kind of an interactive sculpture where 
the idea is that you can uh, show your support for them and you know say a few words by standing on the fourth chair next to them. It's really cool and it's been traveling around Europe for the past couple of years. Um, I don't remember the last time it was in Berlin or Germany in general, but um, supposedly it's going to be there for at least another couple of days, I believe. Um, so if you are in the area and want to check it out, you should do that. Um, but basically a bunch of people uh, or gave speeches, um, some of them actually standing on the sculpture, which is really cool. And one of those was Nils Melzer, and so I'm going to read just the beginning of his statement. So he said, uh, for decades, political dissidents have been welcomed by the West with open arms because, uh, and he delivered this in German, by the way, but he provided an English translation. For decades, political dissidents have been welcomed by the West with open arms because in their fight for human rights, they were persecuted by dictatorial regimes. Today, however, Western dissidents themselves are forced to seek asylum elsewhere, such as Edward Snowden in Russia or, until recently, Julian, Asyl Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. For the West itself has begun to persecute its own dissidents, to subject them to draconian punishments and political show trials, and to imprison them as dangerous terrorists in high security prisons under conditions that can only be described as inhumane and degrading. Our governments feel threatened by Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and Julian Assange because they are whistleblowers, journalists, and human rights activists who have provided solid evidence for abuse, corruption, and war crimes of the powerful for which they are now being systemically defamed and persecuted. They are political dissidents of the West and their persecution is today's witch hunt because they threaten the privileges of an unsupervised state power that has gone out of control. Um, so that was just half of his statement. Um, uh, I don't think, I think probably Rupley uh, did a recording, but um, I haven't watched that. There is, uh, the, there is also, um, on the same day, there was an event at the German Bundestag, which is the parliament. Um, and both of these events were held uh, or organized by Die Linke. Um, the one in the Bundestag was more formal uh, where it's actually a public hearing and a lot of the same speakers uh, were there and you could sit in the audience and listen or watch on the live stream. And um, that was a really great event too. So um, if you haven't, uh, probably I would recommend the Bundestag one because um, those statements were prepared um, in advance a lot of the time. And I think it was like three hours long. So there's a lot of content, but Definitely recommend um, checking those out if you haven't seen them. Mm -hmm. I mean, just I just don't even know what to say anymore. Every time you give an update on what's going on with him, because it's just so fucking insane. Well, so one of the one of the really great developments. Um, I don't know if they had previously made a public statement, but one of the uh, largest journalist unions in Germany, um, one of their representatives was there. And she stated unequivocally that they were opposed to Assange's extradition and also his treatment in Belmarsh. And that was great to see um, because uh, the, <laughs> there, there's a number of journalist organizations, uh, for example, CIJ, that are supposedly, or at least they should be, um, on his side as well. And I think they have made some supportive statements but they also uh, continue to host people at their events who spread falsehoods and they don't do anything to correct it. So um, I'm glad that there's, you know, I, I've been keeping a, a record on my blog of all of the organizations, uh, journalist or otherwise, that have been making statements in support. And so there's been like dozens of them already. Um, again, I don't know about this specific union, whether they did, made a statement already, but it's good to see that there's still a lot of them coming forward and speaking out about this. Mm -hmm. even, even just at an individual level, if it's not big organizations, like that shows something. Ah, man. All right. So are we ready for some happy news? I'm kind of really sad somebody couldn't be here for this. Well, wait, so there's a second update. Oh, okay, I didn't okay, get to the second yeah. one. So the second update is 
kind of a mix, um, but I've been talking about it a lot, and if, if you don't remember it, it's also been on my blog about the uncovering of a, com a Spanish company called UC Global and its involvement in surveillance of the Ecuadorian embassy while Assange was um, residing there and obviously having meetings with friends and lawyers and journalists um, under that roof. Um, and to summarize, as it turns out, the that company, you say Global, um, basically since t at least uh, 2015, they've had a direct relationship with the U.S. government, which was, according to the CEO, apparently it was established at a security convention in Las Vegas in 2015, which um, not completely certain, cross my fingers, but uh, pretty pretty good guess that it was either Black Hat. Um, or DEFCON uh, wouldn't surprise me because those are both full of FBI people all the time. But uh, basically they've had a relationship with the CIA and not only had a relationship with, but the CEO has personally been delivering hard drives of surveillance footage from the embassy to the United States on a regular basis. Um, I don't know how long he's been doing that, but his employee, some of his employees have actually gone under witness protection and they're going to be testifying in the case in Spain that has been opened up um, by uh, Assange's legal team as a complaint against them. Um, and they apparently, I'm not sure of the technical details, but the CIA also had uh, direct access or some kind of access to Basically, the CIA was getting a, like a live stream of the the footage um, from the or at least audio. I don't know if it was video and audio, but they had access um, allegedly to that directly without needing the physical hard drives delivered. Um, I assume the hard drives were more like the pictures and scans that they were doing of the visitors' devices, which is another like oh god huge uh, issue. Um, so there, the news recently is that the um, NDR in Germany released a report about their spying, and it turns out uh, the report, uh, it mentions that um, some NDR journalists also visited Assange in the embassy, and so when they were going over this footage um, the, and the materials, they actually found evidence that their own journalists were... <laughs> Um, also targeted while they visited. So that's a bit awkward. Um, the good news, uh, I think a few episodes ago, um, I talked about how uh, this case in Spain, the judge had specifically requested that the UK allow him to question Assange because Assange is the um, in this case, he is the victim. He's He was the one who was under surveillance. He was the one that the complaint was filed in favor of. And so the judge requested that the UK allow him to be interviewed. And at first, the UK was like, mm, not sure. Can you give us more information? And, you know, it wasn't a straight out no, but any kind of hesitancy or refusal is is pretty unusual. Um, because as he said, a lot of these types of requests are just granted automatically because it's an interview and he's a judge and this is a case that's relevant to him. There should be no reason to not grant it. Um, but uh, since then, the judge has uh, been allowed to question him. I don't, I haven't looked at the details of when that's going to happen or whether that's been scheduled at all, but um, that's good that he's going to be able to um, speak about that and what he experienced and the impact that it had on his living situation there. And like, this is an extremely important case to be following with regards to the extradition case, even though it's in a separate country. Um, and the, the conduct that is alleged to have occurred in the U S extradition case is obviously from 10 years ago now, almost 10 years ago, uh, even though they're separated by 10 years, the fact that the case in the U.S. might have been built on uh, basically material that was not obtained legally um, because you were not only uh, probably violating some kind of international and national laws, by surveilling even Assange as a non-U.S. person, 
But also, it was very obvious that U.S. persons, um, U.S. nationals or uh, residents or whatever, were also included in the number of people that were surveilled at the embassy, including Glenn, Glenn Greenwald um, and many others. So if if that occurred, um, <laughs> that's going to be a giant... Uh, that's going to be a giant nail in the coffin of um, that case because that can have a huge impact on whether it is even viable. If the evidence was not obtained legally, um, that, I mean, in a just world, that, that that would have a major impact and this case would not be able to go forward um, if it was found that the investigators used evidence that was obtained illegally. So very important case and I just wanted to bring that up again. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, yeah, I, I don't really see any other way to challenge the basis of this. So it just comes down to uh, how blatantly are are they willing to just stare at everybody and go, fuck you, the rules are different when we decide so. All right, though. Now, you guys want to get into some happy news? Yes. Yeah, maybe the happy news. So, uh, sadly... No par cannot be here while we congratulate him on this. But ZK Snacks, uh, the company behind Wasabi Wallet, just made their first raise of $337,000 for a 4.5% stake in the company to Cypherpunk Holdings. Uh, the same firm that recently invested $100,000 in Samurai for 1.5% equity. And so this is, you know, this is really fucking awesome for them, I think. Like, they've already been a pretty profitable business to the point of bringing in, you know, I think last July or this, this last July, they earned 14 Bitcoin uh, just through mixing fees um, in that month alone. And so, like, this, I think, is going to be pretty awesome. It's going to give a little extra runway and budgets to start thinking through longer term things and doing research into new mix strategies or tools for post mix. And so this is really fucking awesome. I think like it sucks. He's not here to, to talk about this, but yeah, this is going to be fucking awesome. I expect good things coming out of this. So it might, it might be too hopeful, but I mean, the the primary good thing that I hope that happens out of this is that maybe Samurai and Wasabi stop nope. fighting a little bit, just nope. a little bit. Please, that, that's can they not. It's not going to happen. I I still I I still need to get that set of shy two fifty sixes to continue yelling at both of them. Finished. But oh, yeah, goody. I I, good, I don't good think... on the moderation, <laughs> mediation, whatever. But yeah, I, I don't think this is going to have any effect whatsoever on any of that because there is no way either Samurai or Wasabi would take a deal like this with any kind of don't say things condition. Just not happening. I fully expect, er, I fully expect the shit flinging to continue. Well, I mean, it's not that I, it's not like I, I don't think either of them would have agreed to an actual like clause that says don't shit on each other but i just like you know money does things in subtle ways you know i don't think the incentive here will be powerful enough to stop the feud oh please but i you know i i am glad that they made this raise i'm you know, it's going to be a good thing going forward to have a little extra money to throw at non-maintenance things. And I mean, ultimately, like, you know, mixing is going to be a very touch and go thing. The environment that it happens in, in terms of fees and what that leaves viable is going to change. And it's like, you, you need to keep iterating and moving forward to adapt to that because it's a matter of time until it happens. And, you know... Hopefully this raise uh, takes them a good way down that road of preparing. All right, so next up, um, this is kind of interesting. So 
Germany literally just passed a law that clarifies a uh, bank's ability to sell, buy, or custody Bitcoin uh, or offer those services to their customers. Um, and it even went further than the initial draft of the bill, which would have required banks to use third-party external custodians or split them off into a subsidiary. Um, they can just self-custody things themselves. So uh, when this law goes into effect, uh, 2020, uh, it, it will be completely legal and regulatorily clarified in Germany for banks to sell you Bitcoin, buy your Bitcoin, give you a Bitcoin denominated account at the bank. And I, this is going to be really, really interesting. Like <laughs> when, when banks actually start, you know, integrating and offering those services, like are the normies going to bite? Like, the, the, cause this, this could have really serious consequences in terms of liquidity coming into the market and just the general perception of this, like banks are doing it now, quite literally. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I personally would not be interested in it because there is going to be an obvious conflict with you know on one, on the one hand the banks are going to start broadening the application of negative interest rates to, you know right now it's just at the corporate mostly at the corporate level but i think it's going to slowly start moving down uh you're going to have a conflict between that um and you know if if you have the average german person also holding bitcoin so i mean Hopefully they would control their own keys so it doesn't matter, but I highly doubt that. Um, you're going to have a conflict between those two if they're holding Bitcoin and then the euro is not a good thing to keep in a bank. Um, of course, that's an interesting conflict because that would obviously push them into holding Bitcoin because Bitcoin, at least on the long term, appreciates in value uh, for the most part. So. Yeah, I don't know if that, I don't know how that's going to work in practice because I think there's going to be an issue there, but that would be an interesting conflict to see happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like, I, I'm sure there's going to be a whole rough road of learning the not your keys, not your coins lessons, like layering the typical legacy requirements on top of things. But I mean, like you just hit the nail on the head because that whole dynamic if things go that way um with this kind of regulation and clearance in in the country for banks to just directly like handle bitcoin for customers like this that really could just spiral down and snowball into the german banking sector slowly shifting over to running on bitcoin i mean like really well, this presumably means a lot of business for consultancy firms and startups that are looking for any kind of B2B opportunities because a lot of these banks are going to need to build custodial solutions internally by the looks of it. Um, I am quite optimistic about it. I think it is a good thing, though I think that the run on the banks and the imagery that we see from that, the ATMs, in this case will be people leaving their Bitcoins are inside of the bank and then if anything starts to to look awry they suddenly all start running to start making their you know private keys and suddenly one is going to get messages on legacy social media networks like facebook uh, being asked by aunties and cousins and so forth uh, please please how do i set up a private key because my bank you know it's in the news and i, I need to get my my bitcoins off and i've heard you can do these things and uh, yes i just need some help because i've heard all sorts of things of what i'm supposed to do Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's going to be pains with that, but it's like, if, if that shift happens, like, you, you know, you can't, that, that bank run wipes you out if you were playing games or you're under collateralized like this. Like, I mean, it's like, you know what I mean? I think a lot of Bitcoiners in this space hear banks dealing with Bitcoin and immediately just go fuck that. But I mean, really think about it. Like if, if that happens and played out that way i mean yeah you're still 
dealing with custodians and it's rooted in trust like that, but it's something that is way more checked by the market and directly supports that alternative of pull off to my keys now. Okay, thanks. Like that, that could be a hugely positive thing for Germany as a country. Yeah, I'm optimistic about it. I think it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. So Janine, anything else or slide along to a favorite punching bag? All right, I'll pull out the punching bag. So on November 19th, the U.S. uh, Patent and Trademark Office issued a patent to Coinbase for an automated deep learning system to root out non-compliant user accounts um, and automatically suspend these accounts. And the, the entire system would pretty much be based on, you know, being fed the original data training set and then analyzing and teaching itself to recognize new patterns of illegal activity in accounts and automatically shut them down. Um, some of the things that they are using to create scores to let this thing decide whether to close your account or not or our age, um, your account balance, your transaction volume, your location, your verification history, the number of devices with access. Um, yeah. And like th- this obviously it's it's not something implemented or running right now, but you don't run and go patent things like this um, with that kind of business without the intention to eventually get around to using this. So honestly, um, I would love, love Coinbase to build and implement something like this and just watch it blow up and start pissing off their customer base left and right with false positives and account freezings and for them to learn the lesson that all the big Silicon Valley tech giants have been learning over the last 10 years is AI is a meme, algorithms suck, and they fuck up constantly. (laughs) So I, I would really love to see Coinbase roll this out and just start driving customers away in droves. It, it would be awesome. Um, it sounds like a whole bunch of compliance officers going to have to learn how to code now. Um, I was actually pretty bullish on the compliance officer. I was going to go along that shit 100x, uh, but now I'm not so sure because it turns out that all those lawyers are going to be automated away. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I mean, like re- realistically, though, I mean, like I, I, I see why a company like Coinbase would look into shit like this, like cut costs, cut costs, cut costs, more profit. But like the, these kinds of automated filter and like reaction systems are used by all the big fucking tech companies all over the place. And it's like you take one glance at it. It's false positives out the ass all day. Like, how on earth would you think you can maintain a, you know, good customer experience with that? Well, I think that they, they're under pressure, aren't they? And they need to do something um, and they perhaps cannot even afford. I mean, talk about cutting costs. I'm not sure those costs have been, been incurred yet. I think it's the anticipation of future costs um, and a roadmap that includes acceptance among uh, the or well, within the empire and among the mainstream um, and they think that in order to do that that they need to do their part in polishing up the reputation that the industry has um, and they think that this AI will on average uh, find uh, bad actors uh, more than it will find good actors and they'll just deal with uh, the false positives as they arise and that it will probably be a safer bet for their capital to go in this direction with this investment than it would to speculate on some, you know, law graduates and to perhaps a couple of supervisory, uh, you know, uh, lawyers uh, overseeing them. I think they're just shitting their pants, realizing that we're still in the kiddie pool and the big boys are coming. I mean, like imagine how, or how many people a bank like HSBC has to employ to deal with customer service and complaints and and making sure that these types of fuck ups are dealt with immediately. You know what I mean? And they still fuck it up and people fucking rant and rave and get pissed off all day long. 
Uh, do you think Coinbase can really pull off funding that even with like how much money they've been making the last like um, eight years or whatever? Like, do, do you really think that they can profitably afford that? Unless an account is turning over tens of millions a week, um, they're not interested. It's not worth their, their time. They can leave that person indefinitely on hold and leave them in a queue on Zendesk for weeks and weeks. It makes no difference to them because if that customer runs away, uh, nothing happens. It's, it's, a round, it's not even a rounding error on their business business model well they care about the prime you know customers the the fact that i think they have even have a product called prime uh, they're interested in the institutional investors all of this legacy that the coinbase has going all the way back to the bitcoin talk forum um is just part of its marketing strategy now it's it's just part of its history um but it doesn't form any basis in their future so yeah. I, have a, I have a funny thing to mention related to this. Um, I think it was the last episode or the episode before that that um, I mentioned as my, my final thought, the tweet from MalwareTech, um, Marcus, uh, about cryptocurrency exchange KYC being the TSA of finance. And I noticed that... Uh, Haley Lennon, who is the regulatory counsel at Coinbase, actually responded to him and said, uh, quote, struggle with this concept. I know very well how invasive KYC can feel to users, especially in the crypto space. This is why regulators and centralized exchanges requirements should focus on actual, actually effective KYC measures, not KYC just to meet a rule slash check a box, which is like, Great sentiment, but I don't see Coinbase, you know, they're not going to, I don't see them loosening restrictions at this point. Um, so if they're already terrible, I don't see them getting better from this point on. Um, my first question, if they're going to be using AI in this stuff is like, how do they actually determine what a good or bad actor is? Are they doing it just on the you know, activity within the app or the trading activity or whatever, or are they also considering, like, are they doing it kind of preemptively based on the, you know, personal information that the customer provides um, and whether they consider anything about them to be a red flag, like the state that they live in, or maybe even down to the address. Like there's probably tons of you know, analysis software out there about, you know, predicting someone's tendency towards criminality based on what part of a state or city they live in or whatever. I'm oh, sure that oh, yeah. exists. So oh, fun fact most people don't know is there are all kinds of houses on watch lists by local police departments just based on like random complaints for neighbors or bullshit that some cop assumed wildly wrong. Like that shit happens. Yeah, so I'd be like, I don't, I, I have no optimism whatsoever about involving an AI in these kinds of decisions because it's most of the time, it's like, it's a negative for the customer. They're going to be discriminated in some, it's going to be like the whole Apple credit situation. Someone is going to be discriminated against in some unusual way that makes sense to the algorithm, but in, you know, upon actually looking closer at it is not fair, uh, at least, you know, according to, I don't know, whatever, KYC is not supposed to be about, you know, just excluding people based on their address or whatever, just because it looks suspicious in some database or something. And there's, you know, you can't link the actual person to that activity that should be happening, but it probably will happen. So I'd be interested to know what kinds of data this thing is going to be looking at to determine whether someone is complying with their terms of service or not. All the shit you just went through, pretty much just profiling people. But, you know, you need to learn to read between the lines, you know, trying to make more effective KYC. They are clearly working on brain scanning devices that can 100% objectively find out whether you're going to do illegal stuff or not. And they'll add that to the procedure. Yeah, it's it's going to be fun. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is I... 
Like, I have never, ever since they had the rule that you can't use a passport as an ID, I have not been able to use Coinbase, and I find that extremely hilarious because Coinbase is all like, we're building open finance, we're revolutionizing finance. It's like, your your whole revolution doesn't even include a relatively normal documented person you know i'm not i'm not a complete anomaly that i'm not enough of an anomaly to be excluded from the banking system yet um don't know about later but yeah i just find it extremely funny that i can't use coinbase because i don't have the right identity document um and i don't think that that's going to improve i'm certainly not going to uh put any any money of mine at risk to a system that is making automated decisions like this and could potentially like coinbase is already they're already i would be surprised if they don't have a lot of automated stuff that is making like account shutdown decisions and things like that um or at least freezing accounts so it's only going to get worse from here and i don't i have no interest in putting my money at risk because if i wanted that i would just go to a bank and actually a bank a lot of the time sounds safer than Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can round this off with a unanimous fuck you, Coinbase. No, round it off with delete Coinbase. Yes, delete you, Coinbase. Speaking of that, I do have a tiny little update that I can give about um, hacking team. Yeah, I guess you want to do that real quick before we get into the last one. So there was a very interesting interview in technology at technologyreview.com. Um, basically, it was an interview with Paulo Lezzi, who um, I don't, I think, I believe he's the CEO of the company that bought the rest of Hacking Team. Coinbase gave a bunch of millions of dollars to the other part that des decided to break off um, and try to salvage their reputation a different way. But this guy was interviewed about like they called it like revival from disgrace or something and i don't think the interviewer bought that argument at all but that's how it was framed and he said that um he had this comment because the first question he gets asked is how do you prevent abuse and he said um that it's impossible for this software which they obviously repurposed a lot of hacking team stuff in combination with another company that they bought and they kind of put the two together they say that human rights abuses are impossible be to to commit using their software because they limit the number of software agents they sell to their to each customer to 50 so they're saying you can't commit human rights abuses because you don't have enough software agents. You only have 50. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, that, what the like, fuck? It's, it's the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard. Like if anyone, as I said um, yesterday, it's like anyone who buys that is you're, you're either a complete idiot or you're just so willfully ignorant about technology and human rights that it's like you shouldn't be running this company because that's a completely absurd statement the idea that because he makes this thing like oh he, he frames human rights abuses as being like vast and indiscriminate spying and it's like i don't want to live in a country where they believe that the only kinds of human rights abuses are the ones that are committed on a vast scale it's like if you've gotten to that point you're you're beyond just mere human rights abuses you're into like you're 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 going into something more serious but like the idea that you can't commit human rights abuses with even one software agent is ridiculous like one infection one software agent can do that so i don't know what bizarre world he's living in but these are the kinds of people that coinbase gave money to these are the kinds of people who apparently are still allowed to sell their technology and are making money and it's just disgusting what do you mean i'm a war criminal i'm just one guy it can't be a war if it's just one guy like what the fuck yeah it's that's retarded all right last but definitely not least Bitcoin Core 0.19 is out, but make sure you download 0.19.0.1 because there were some bugs in the initial release. But this is 
actually some pretty significant changes uh, going on. So there are a lot of RPC changes um, and some new ones regarding um, moving towards refactoring how balanced data um, is accessed through the RPC, um, a new flag system to specify uh, specific default behaviors only for certain wallets, and um, the first wave of BIP 158's Neutrino support. So you can now build uh, Neutrino indexes for the entire chain, or Neutrino filters for the entire chain with a new block filter index. But for now, they are only accessible through the RPC and are not delivered over the peer to peer network yet. Um, as well, there's now a uh, new white bind and whitelist features. Um, you can granularly um, set different permission levels for RPC access, depending on either a specific network interface or a specific source IP address. So that is pretty cool. Uh, you can kind of lock down the RPC to specific interfaces and such, and then guarantee granular um, permissions access based on that. So that is pretty cool, uh, as well as some efficiency gains with the database cache. Um, you can now set it a little bit higher in terms of the amount of memory you set um, when you pass the argument, but it physically is not actually using that much physical memory. So there's a little bit of efficiency gains. Uh, you want to increase the DB cache during bootstrap and things like that. And then this, I'm betting, is going to get, or no, I'm first before that, um, the GUI uh, wallet is now showing BEC32 by default. Uh, that's pretty awesome. As well as uh, BIP70 support uh, disabled by default. Now on to the probably controversial thing. Um, we have hit the point where by default, um, core nodes are no longer going to accept or serve data based on Bloom filters. And in the long run, um, you, you can still manually set your node with this release to do so, but in the long run, um, things are probably going to move in the direction of completely deprecating um, serving SPV proofs in response to Bloom filters. So in, in another release or two, um, that's just not going to be a service offered by up-to-date nodes. So people who use wallets based on that are either going to have to specifically ensure they can connect to their own node to support that or start looking or working on projects to serve this data as a special service because it's on the way out in Bitcoin Core. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, good riddance. Uh, that type of wallet is not safe and is a very dangerous thing if a majority of people are just using SPV nodes like that blindly following proof of work. So that is the real important notes for the new version of Core. You guys go update and find all the bugs so I can wait a month or two and make sure mine has none. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Yeah, so I guess, you know, any opinions on the whole uh, deprecating uh, Bloom filter SPV support? Well, it hurts privacy, right? Um, so I think it's a, a good idea. But uh, other than that, I will be updating my client uh, pretty shortly after the show. Sweet. You take the plunge first. No, I live for that shit. I mean, I think, I think people should have at least a couple of nodes running. I'm a conservative, paranoid lunatic who generally lags a version or two behind. I honestly don't even remember what version I'm running right now. <laughs> All right, so that'll wrap it up for the day. And final thoughts. It seems, it seems like if you were a true concerned, paranoid lunatic, you would know what version you're running. Maybe I'm lying to throw people off. Oh, I'm still on 0.18. But yeah. I guess uh been a really long episode today. I think we spent 45 minutes just talking about sanctions and Virgil. Uh, so what do we want to take it out on today, guys? Give me some good thoughts. Well, 
my final thought is uh, pray for Virgil. Genuinely hope that he's going to be okay. And I look forward to news that he is going to be released on bail and we can actually have a sensible conversation about the law. Yeah, here, here. I can agree with that. I have two thoughts. It's usually me reading other people's tweets that I've liked over the last week. <laughs> so the first one is a uh, quote from Crypto Graffiti. He said, with mass surveillance, we're all podcast hosts. Some of us just have less obvious subscribers, which I love. <laughs> Lol. What's the next one? And the second one is the main quote that i thought was funny from preston burns uh not legal advice post that he made to uh ye well technically today um he said anyone who made a, mod a lot of money in ether should understand that just because you made one good investment back in 2014 and haven't had to do any real work since doesn't mean you're a polymath more likely you're a dumbass and you got lucky here here all right i guess my that thought or whoops Sorry. That also applies to um, so-called Bitcoin maximalists who just invested in Bitcoin in 2017 and then apparently stopped being maximalists and want to promote people like Rajiver or, you know. Oh, God. Okay, so the one thing that we... <laughs> the one thing I forgot to mention, there was a hilarious uh, tweet from Rajiver there was a meme going around that someone had, I don't know if it was an actual picture of Virgil on stage, but someone had photoshopped. Uh, I have to go find it just one second because I don't want to, I don't want to make it up. It was too good. Re and yeah, it's a, it was a, I, who made that carbon based, I think made that if I'm thinking of the same one you are. Yeah, so so Roger Ver made a tweet that says, Sanctions are an act of war. People enacting sac sanctions are waging war. People opposing sanctions are opposing war. Hashtag free Virgil, blah, blah, blah. And then the picture he used, again, I'm not sure if this is a real picture of Virgil on stage, but it, it has a person standing on stage. And then the photoshopped uh, <laughs> talk title is How I Evaded Sanctions and How You Can Too, Using Ethereum to Evade, evade Sanctions in 2019. And so he used this, he used this this meme unironically in a political tweet, and I just was like, "Roger, come on." <laughs> S M A T. I mean, S M A R T. It's like, so I'm does this bit? Wait, wait. Does this mean that Ethereum actually has a utility now? It's actually useful for something. No, no, no. So that's that's what people are laughing about. They're like, some of them are like, you guys shouldn't be making a big deal out of this because if, if you're saying that he actually helped North Korea, you're saying that Ethereum is useful for that. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous <laughs> like, claim. No. Yeah. That might actually be his defense. That would be oh, fucking God hilarious damn. if that no. is actually his defense. <laughs> Please, no. Oh, well, I would like to know because I don't, I don't, from reading it, I don't remember whether it was actually clear that he made the transfer or if he was just intending to. So maybe he didn't even make it, which would be, yeah. That would be funny. All right. So my final thought is going to be very serious and very cryptic. Within a matter of days, you will all be scrambling over each other to give me your bitcoin <laughs> and on that confusing note i guess uh this has been an awesome episode 200 uh really glad you came on uh chris and i hope everybody enjoys adios punks pleasure to be here pleasure to be here see you guys better not be ransomware <laughs> Was there that sang it just